This is the story of the people who searched beneath Ground Zero. When the twin towers of the World Trade Center collapsed, they created a whole new landscape. What looked like a field of rubble was merely the surface of an underground world of caverns, shafts and passageways, hundreds of feet deep. With access to the extraordinary footage shot by the emergency workers, this is the untold story of the search for the victims of 9-11. At 9.59 a.m., less than an hour after it was hit, the South Tower collapsed. In 10 seconds, the entire building disintegrated in an avalanche of pulverized steel and concrete. Thirty minutes later, the North Tower also collapsed. A city in the sky burst apart into a scene of complete devastation. It fell to the ground with such destructive power, it created a whole new geography of broken steel structures and mountains of rubble spread over a wasteland the size of 16 football pitches. Those that could help were actually allowed to join in. One of them was retired firefighter Lee Ielpi, who was desperately searching for his son, Jonathan. I met up with many dads that were looking for their sons. Many sons looking for dads. I saw people from Squad 288. That's Jonathan's house. I saw them. They saw me. As well as retired firefighters, construction workers also descended on Ground Zero and offered to help. And so the searchers became an extraordinary mixture of professionals and volunteers, bonded by a common knowledge that somewhere beneath the surface lay their family and friends. In the days ahead, the rescuers would risk their lives entering the voids deep beneath Ground Zero. The rescue and recovery search at Ground Zero was deeply personal, even for the man jointly in charge of the whole operation. Commander Bill Keegan's personal quest began when he was given a list of the missing. When I looked at this piece of paper, too. The day after 9-11, the search and rescue teams began a concentrated effort to find every survivor. On the surface of the rubble pile, bucket brigades sifted through the debris, while others cut their way through the impenetrable mesh of concrete and steel, excavating their way down. There's a void in that comes in here, comes in over there, and get in underneath here. Where chasms and voids opened up, Rescue teams were sent in to explore. It was believed that many of the 5,000 missing would be down there, some of them alive, and that they might be able to survive for up to two weeks. As they made their first tentative steps into the darkness below, they spray-painted their path downwards in case they were trapped in a fall. Even descending the first 20 to 30 feet was very dangerous, but it was a risk worth taking for Lee ILP desperate to find his firefighter's son, Jonathan. We thought, well, we have a, a grace period here. We've got two weeks just to get into as many of these cracks and crevices and get down deep to find them. Going in, if you had to stop and sit down and think, you might worry that, man, I, this thing can come down any minute. So you just kept your mind active. During the first 50 feet of their descent, the rescue teams were confronted by a mass of twisted beams and crushed ceilings. Then they began to find signs of what had been there before. Further down, they discovered staircases that were almost intact, which aided their descent into the underworld. Another van! The deeper they went, the more preserved everything was. A hundred feet down, they found an eerie world of underground shopping malls and car parks that in places were virtually untouched. When you'd enter into a location, it looked as it did on September 10th. Some of the parking areas, the cars were in pristine condition. A lot of the cars were driven out of the place. 
And then you just go a few feet to the right and you'd see utter devastation. So we would make our way into these nice areas and then get down on our bellies and our knees and start to crawl, hoping that some area would open up. And when we got to this open area, we would find people. Some of the rescue teams worked their way through the chasms and stairways down to the remains of the World Trade Center subway station. Here they were confronted with surreal scenes of destruction. That's the one we're in. That's the one we need to get to. As the search for survivors continued in the voids, three weeks after 9-11, only 220 bodies had been identified with no trace of the thousands still reported missing. The immense destructive force unleashed by the collapse of the Twin Towers had literally blown apart most of the people left inside. Some had simply been vaporized in the explosions. The human remains recovered on Ground Zero would be unrecognizable to their nearest and dearest. The search to find every last victim of 9-11 was about to take the recovery teams further into the voids. This opens up into a large space. We may want to take a look. As the ground above them became more unstable, their quest became even more dangerous. One of the most vivid memories of the searchers is of the overpowering smell of decomposing bodies. It was so all-pervasive cadaver dogs had to be used to pinpoint their exact location. Going into the voids below ground zero became increasingly dangerous as clear-up operations continued above ground. If we guys start getting some shifting, the thing you need to look for is something that you can dive underneath and you're going to be somewhat protected. Like, a huge beam like this beam, huge dive in between the columns. As we're walking down, as we're working our way down, you want to make sure that Retired firefighter Lee 